Office Hours is brought to you by Rebus Community and the Open Textbook Network. At Rebus Community, we're building a new collaborative model for open textbook publishing. So quickly, if you're unfamiliar with the Open Textbook Network, we are a community working together to improve open education through open textbook strategy, strategies. Um, right now, we have members representing more than 600 institutions and together have saved students uh, more than 8.5 million through open education programs. Liz, would you like me to introduce our guest today or would you like to do that? Since you're muted, I'll take that as my cue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please introduce. Okay, so um, we are glad to have with us today four guests who will talk on um, open textbook adoptions and adaptions and how they track them at their organization. Our first guest is Tim Robbins. He's assistant professor of English at Graceland University. We will then hear from Karen Bjork, who's head of digital initiatives at Portland State University. Then we'll turn it over to Anthony Palmiotto, who's editorial director at OpenStax. And then finally, we'll hear from Rosie Linenquist, who's a fellow in open access and education initiatives, as well as assistant professor in library media at uh, Southern Utah University. So um, if you haven't joined us for office hours in the past, um, it's a casual conversation. Everyone will talk for around five minutes and then we will turn things over to you so that we can uh, talk about what's important to you and, and answer your questions. So uh, without further ado, Tim, I will turn things over to you. Great, hi. I'm still being able to hear, being heard, great. So uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I teach English at the at Graceland University. We're a small liberal arts college in Iowa. Uh, I guess that's important because we have an incredibly tiny department, which means I'm the only person who teaches the American Literature Survey. Uh, and teaching that and designing that course is how I got mixed up with the Rebus community and uh, am now editing with them the open anthology of uh, early American literature. Uh, and so I've been working for like a year with a host of volunteers, uh, other instructors, students, librarians, uh, technologists, and so forth to build a comprehensive OER anthology to use in the kinds of literature survey courses uh, that I teach. And early American literature, I guess, for the uninitiated begins with like the advent of European colonialism uh, up to the 20th century in the United States. And that survey course is still pretty much standard fare at most four-year colleges and universities in the States. Um, so uh, it's, it's one that's in demand and it's one that um, anthologies for to be pretty hefty and, and pricey. Um, I guess it, it probably bears mentioning that some people probably recognize this project began with Robin DeRosa at Plymouth State where she worked alongside uh, students to develop various chapters in the anthology and I adopted her model for my survey course and uh, have been essentially adding chapters with my students here at Graceland for the last two fall semesters. Um, and yeah, and here we are. And so in terms of adoption and adaptation of the text we've been working on, again, for over a year uh, we've been, and when, when I say we, basically all the credit for this goes to Aperva and Zoe at Rebus Community um, for the text development. Um, they've been the best and most organized and responsive colleagues uh, imaginable. And um, we've been reaching out to different kinds of contributors again and compiling their responses, editing and formats, uh, along with student assistants that I've been working with here at Graceland who've been effectively the copy editors uh, working through work study, which is nice. Um, so we're still gaining con contributions to the table of contents and then add them to our master spreadsheet as contributions sort of slowly trickle in. But in terms of adoption adaptation, uh, we're hoping to sort of officially launch the anthology this coming summer in hopes to begin uh, to begin really, I guess, rallying uh, rallying adopters for the coming fall semester. But I, I can speak to, I guess, part of the benefit of having such a monstrous text like this anthology, which has dozens of contributors is that we have uh, 
some promising leads in terms of adopters in coming semesters. Many of our contributors are, eager, are already eager to bring the anthology uh, into their classrooms. And in addition to the anthology, I'm providing lesson plans and tips to help adopt, uh, to, to adopt the anthology as the kind of, I don't know, like boss challenge rather than a term paper for the end of the semester. And I sort of began, uh, began sketching that out in a chapter in the book that Liz edited last year, um, which just won the OE Consortium Award. So uh, that was really nice. And um, I begin, I've talked about the book as much as possible at the Modern Language Association Convention just a couple of months ago. I chaired a roundtable on um, using OER with students uh, and integrating it into lessons and uh, had great feedback and gained some more uh, promised uh, adopters who were nice enough to come to our 8 a.m. panel in the middle of a blizzard during MLA in January. Uh, and I guess finally I can speak to, um, from the faculty perspective, uh, Liz just emailed me and asked, and asked about this. And I, I think in terms of perhaps getting Oops, sorry, I lost the lost the feed here for a second. Sorry about that. In terms of uh, thinking about the anthology work and gaining adopters and adapters for tenure and promotion purposes, or for uh, having your having your work count for grant writing, uh, I don't necessarily have a lot to say to that. Except when when the Rebus community approached me last year to to asked me to be lead editor, uh, I, I, I was getting it in writing with my um, department chair in terms of having this count for promotion. I guess I'd be happy to talk more about that in, during the breakout session if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Karen. Hello. Um, so yeah, my name is Karen Bjork. I'm head of digital initiatives at Portland State University. Um, and Portland State University Library's Open Textbook Publishing Initiative works with faculty authors to publish high quality uh, open textbooks designed specifically for PSU courses. And as of today, we, we've published a new book today, which I'm super excited about. Um, we've published 16 open textbooks and they cover the following subject areas. It's uh, intensive English language, Spanish, Arabic, Japanese, chemistry, mathematics, uh, Korean, special education, urban planning, and gender and sexuality studies. So as you can see, we have this wide range of textbooks in which we're offering, and they're being used throughout Portland State um, and in the classroom, and we do track like how often our textbook authors are using their, their uh, textbooks in their classes. And we also ask our textbook authors if anybody within their department has adopted their book and have used it for the classes within uh, Portland State. But we have really struggled with trying to find a way to know if people outside of Portland State have downloaded and adopted the book for their courses. Um, we have download reports. All of our stuff, uh, all of our open textbooks are put into our institutional repository. And through that, we get download reports um, so we can see how often our books are being downloaded. We can track where people are coming from. We know if they are affiliated with the university. But beyond that, we really can't tell like why they're adopting the book. We can't tell what courses they're teaching in. We can't tell if they're just students that are interested in the book or you know, what, what exactly they're doing with the book. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about like how do you best uh, go and you know, how do you best try to track this? Um, so a couple of the thoughts that I have had is this idea of adding a link into the metadata records that says, hey, have you adopted this? Let us know. Um, but I haven't found that people like to fill out a lot of forms and that isn't always uh, the best way. But I've been thinking, we do have a feedback form in our repository already. So I think we might just try to give that a try and see what kind of responses we have. Uh, we're really hoping that the Open Textbook Library since they are collecting data from all of their institutions about adoptions, that if they hear of somebody adopting our textbook, 
that you know they could say hey Portland State we know that the University of Minnesota you know had adopted this for you um, I'm not certain what their records show but I figure since they're already doing the survey maybe they can do the work for us maybe not um, and then we once a year go and contact all of the PSU authors uh, and say have you heard about your textbooks being adopted and we have actually gotten pretty good responses so the the textbooks that they have heard about getting adopted are kind of interesting uh, so one of them in particular is our Arabic textbook um, it's been adopted by an Italian colleague that is using it as a way to help Arabic speaking refugees so they're trying to teach faculty in the departments um, how to how to sort of learn Arabic so that they can go out into the field and sort of help refugees and they're also trying to they're using it as well to help their students um, our beginning Japanese for professional book which is book one is our <laughs> is our most popular book and I was just going to look to see the download rates so that book has had 33,000 downloads which is absolutely incredible um, and we have learned that part of the reason is that it is being used in language training centers, um, particularly for business people who are going over to Japan as a way to quickly learn basic Japanese. Uh, so Americans that are going over to, to Japan. Um, and that has been a, a really successful way for them. They've used the book, they've adapted it for their own needs. And then I recently found out uh, from a fellow librarian that her a faculty at her institution is actually interested as well in adopting this uh, the Japanese book for professionals so a lot of it right now for us has been word for word of mouth which is not a very great way of gathering statistics um, so it's yeah it's been a big struggle for us thanks Karen I think word of mouth may be a trend as both you and Tim have already talked about it um, okay Anthony we'd like to hear from you next sure thanks um, hi everybody so I'm from OpenStax and we um, publish uh, high quality textbooks mostly for the intro courses uh, heavily weighed towards stem and social sciences but we also have a history book and we're developing a business series now um, and we you know look to track adoptions, just like Karen was saying, could be very, very challenging um, when instructors who are used to not really tracking the adoptions themselves, but you know, their bookstores basically tracked previous adoptions, you know, through sales. And that's how, you know, such a traditional publisher might get the information. With OER, you don't have that in the same way in most cases. So we're very interested in tracking and um, it helps with our updating, it helps with our revision processes and also reporting back to funders and other stakeholders about our use. Um, so um, we, 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 I'll separate this into two categories, if it's okay. We first, um, about the initial adoption, when somebody adopts a book new, uh, first time they've adopted it, um, uh, maybe first time teaching the course or first time that they're uh, using our book instead of another. Uh, the first thing we do, we do ask. I think that there is this expectation among faculty that they will need to do something to adopt a textbook. Um, some that that in our case has translated. I don't know the exact number. I would say something probably between thirty and fifty percent of of instructors being willing to fill out a form, you know, as Karen was mentioning, or do something else, sort of as a reciprocation for uh, adopting an open textbook. Um, they that that might also be sort of looped into the bookstore process that they would normally do uh, but we asked them to fill out a for a, a brief survey and we try to keep it as brief as possible just about their their course makeup you know how many students they might have the name of their course things like that their email and obviously you know do they want to be contacted do they want information about this or that so that we can tailor any future communications properly to them and not spam them or anything like that um we, uh, a few other ways that we, we go about doing that, we, um, we also do submit, uh, we pro provide ancillaries, and some of those ancillaries are uh, instructor only, and that's not to restrict their use, but um, if there are answers to test questions or instructor facing solutions, we restrict those only to faculty. That's a pretty standard practice that many faculty are, are used to. 
I know that in the open community, there are um, some advocates for removing that, so, you know, keeping everything, even answers, open. But, you know, we, we're going with the faculty indications and the, they, they seem to heavily want some things restricted. So we make um, obtaining those, those types of assets, you know, one of the quali qualifications is, you know, you fill out a brief survey. So that's another way we track. Um, the other way we do it is uh, by errata submissions. So when people tell us that something's wrong in the book, most of the time, and we, we, we ask, but most of the time it, they're, they're doing it because they're using the textbook and we're able to know that they're an adopter and then we, we can get more information that way. Um, the other two ways are, you know, other OER advocates on campus, um, OER librarians and administrators and, and so on, OER advocates, will share that information with us about their own campus or, or others, as uh, you know, we mentioned at Portland State. Um, and then we get information from our partners, uh, ecosystem partners. We have formal ecosystem partners with a variety of companies and, and OER organizations, and they tell us, we always try to verify it. We're working with various other uh, education organizations, such as the, the California Community College's Online Education Initiative, uh, they've actually created Canvas versions of our textbooks, and we share information about adoptions of those that way. We find that a lot of adoption through that. And then there are other organizations doing you know, surveys and other OER or other just regular educational research, research that's shared. Um, briefly, I'll just mention that that's the first time of adoption. The, one of the hard parts for us is, does that adoption continue over time? Are we retaining the adoption? And sometimes as a factor of course changes, um, you know, course assignments changes, professors teaching different things, different makeups, different course coordinators, that, that changes. We do, if people have opted in, we've, we send out a, a renewal survey every year. Um, and we don't get a huge response rate on that, um, but obviously anybody who does respond, we take that information. And if somebody doesn't respond after a certain amount of time, I think it's two years, we assume that they're no longer adopting. Uh, we just try to be realistic with our, our expectations and, and our funders and, and things like that. And um, finally, on the, the tracking side, we actually use Salesforce, uh, which is an enterprise you know, level uh, customer relationship management software that you know, tracks all sorts of sales for all sorts of companies. In our case, it's a little different, but it's a big database of people, so it's helpful to have it organized that way. We track it at the individual instructor level. Um, at the institutional level and so on. There's a lot of cross-pollination you can do and a lot of report generation that we're able to, to do. Also, it allows us to do outreach based on their previous responses. Uh, that's about it for me. I'm looking forward to any questions you all have. Thanks, Anthony. And I will turn it over to Rosie for our last uh, guest speaker. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, so I am the Open Education um, Resources Librarian. Um, I've got a much longer title that's like Open Access and Education Initiatives um, Librarian. And so I was hired fairly recently at Southern Utah University to promote um, OER on campus and to kind of really do a big overhaul on our general education courses. And so since the initiative is still really in its infancy, a lot of what I have been doing is trying to just establish that foundation of figuring out who is already using OER, who is potentially interested, um, and then how to track that. So I wanted to see if I could share, let me try this. I'm not super technology. Let's see, so can you all see my screen? Or are you still seeing me? Okay, excellent. So this is the first thing that I tend to do. Um, I'm, it's called Trello, it's a free open source um, platform. And so one of the things that I do is I track all the adoptions in this one by course. And so I have them um, by department and then which courses are using open educational resources. And then the ones that have the little yellow tab, those are general education courses. And so within that, um, I also have a card. So this one's specifically for non-majors, and then I would have a link. So this one um, is actually a really, really cool biology um, 1020 plus English 1010 um, hybrid course, which is such a super awesome course where the students are creating their materials. So I don't have a link, but normally I would have a link to like OpenStax or something in Open Textbook Library. The other thing that I use also to track um, GE courses, I don't have access, I'm at home, so I don't have access to the database, but this is um, the spreadsheet that I use to create um, the Microsoft database that I use, and it's tracked by um, course name, and this is 
something that I can pull PDF reports out where I can actually pull numbers as to which semesters they were adopted, if they're continuing adoption, if it's the same instructor using over and over again. Um, and that's kind of what this all looks like. And it also talks about which um, knowledge area, so which um, in our catalog, which, oops, which um, core requirement that course is fulfilling. Um, so that way it's really easy for us to see if it's um, a science-based or if it's a humanities-based course. And then the last one, oh, if I can get there, maybe. I wanted to share was um, I do by semester. So I have information about the faculty member. Oh my goodness, sorry. And then how much they're, um, they were spending on the textbook. And then this one is the, the prices and how much we're saving for students. So I have a few different um, ways to kind of organize and track and really, um, like everyone seems to have been saying, word of mouth seems to be the best way that I'm gathering information um, by talking to people, getting out on campus and really talking with faculty. I do send out emails twice a year at the beginning of the fall semester and the spring semester just to remind people that, hey, I'm here. And also here are a few kind of questions about which course you're teaching, how many students, um, if they know the textbook um, that they were using and then which one they are using. And then um, I forward that information to everyone who needs it. Okay. Thank you, Rosie. It's always great to see the tools that we use uh, in our real life day to day work. We also use Trello for the open textbook library. It's how I communicate with student assistants and um, evaluate submissions for the collection. So it's fun to see it um, on someone else's screen. So as um, all of you think of your questions and what you would like to talk about with our guests, um, I will just acknowledge and address a comment that Karen made about her hopes with the Open Textbook Library. Um, so we do, of course, collect data and share that with our members. We're talking currently with our steering committee about a future that may involve sharing the data openly so that there's uh, more data that would then also be available to researchers. And that's something that we would discuss with the community and get their feedback on and uh, try to figure out if it's doable. And then um, we also are talking about the next iteration of the library and what that looks like in terms of building communities around textbooks, um, collecting, as Anthony talked about, you know, people who are um, turning in errata or um, maybe have adopted or have suggestions for future editions, but really trying to get you know, the, the human group together around those resources. Um, so that's uh, what we're thinking about right now and possibly talking about at Open Ed should our proposal be accepted. So um, however you like to raise your questions, please feel free to unmute and ask them or put them right in the chat. Um, while you're doing that, Tim, um, you mentioned, um, how you hope to rally adopters um, around the anthology when you launch this summer. And it sounded like one of the ways you're going to do that is that the contributors, of course, are going to be adopting the work they've contributed to, probably marketing it to their colleagues and their departments. Um, and this is such a big part of textbook um, publishing and peer review. If you could talk a little bit um, more about that and, and if there are systematic ways that you hope to track that, that maybe um, will go beyond word of mouth or if there's someone you might collaborate with um, on your campus to do that. Thanks, Karen. Uh, you know, it's not something I've thought about tracking on this, this end, although this has been really illuminating uh, to see what other folks are, are, are up to. Uh, because we're a small university, you know, our, our resources are limited in terms of the librarian here, although he's a huge advocate for OER and has been working with me to try to spread the gospel, at least here on campus. So I think he would be amenable to helping track that. Um, yeah, in terms of kind of, as I said, rallying other faculty, basically what I, all I've been doing to try to get contributors is kind of hitting up the, net, the academic networks that I've always worked with in terms of early Americanist historians, uh, and a lot of them who who've kind of admitted that they don't have time to contribute have also said, you know, keep me in line because when this launches, I, I really want to be a part of it and I, I'm totally behind uh, this effort. And so I think in this summer, in addition to sort of pushing, pushing across the goal line, I really need to give 
a lot of thought and maybe tap into some of the folks here and others about how to actually track um, track this thing when it when it takes off. Yeah, I think our, our one takeaway already from this conversation is probably it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be something we all really, really want to do. Um, but we haven't found um, a great way to do it. So um, Karen has has thanked all of you for sharing the um, open textbook they published just today. Congratulations again, Karen. Um, I'm tempted to just allow an awkward silence so that a question bubbles up. All right, Karen, you know when you say that, <laughs> Richard has to stick his nose in somewhere. Great, thanks Richard. Um, a question for you, and this is a comment that I think would be applicable to anybody who does internal publishing other than OpenStax, and I have used OpenStax in my own teaching. One thing that I think would be very helpful as institutions look at publishing work for their own faculty. If you want to adopt it elsewhere, it would be useful to include a chapter or some sort of uh, instructions on how do I contribute to this work? Or better yet, how do I use this work in my own classes? So for instance, you might have a chapter in the front or a, a small short section in the front saying, here's how this book has been used. Here's who you talk to to contribute here's what you can do with it. You know, everybody, many people know the, uh, what a Creative Commons license does, but it's much nicer to have it in text exactly how somebody maybe has applied that Creative Commons license. So giving, I'd be interested to know if you were to do that, what would you say in your text? How would you, how would you put it out there for the rest of the, rest of the world? I'm curious too, so I'll echo Richard's question. I do know that Anita Walls at Virginia Tech has also been thinking about this topic and has um, put some language um, that I will go look for as you guys are talking um, and share in the chat. But I think, you know, Karen mentioned that we all sort of feel this reluctance about adding another form or a survey or this expectation that someone needs to fill something out. But then Anthony countered with, well, I think it's reasonable if faculty are adopting an open textbook to sort of share that information. So I think part of it is our own struggle or tension in doing that. And also just feeling um, confident that we're getting the right information or enough information or representative information anyway. Um, Anthony, I was really um, sort of marveling at the many streams of uh, data that you guys are collecting from. And so um, a, another question is how sort of all of that gets um, compiled if you have someone dedicated to sort of sorting out all of those streams. I can answer that very quickly. I mean, first of all, on the, the I know you didn't mean to set it out the way, but sort of the point counterpoint, I didn't mention like with the survey that we send out and, and the adopt now form and things like that, we don't get 100% anything like it, you know, so I think, I think Karen's right. I think some professors are reluctant um, and they want to know how information is going to be used and it, it brings up more questions, but a number of them do provide the information and we, we feel like um, it's, it's relatively accurate because they're kind of putting their names to it in a, in a way. So it's kind of the most we can ask for at that point, at least um, on the comp compilation of all those different sources. Well, first of all, you know, again, all those different sources didn't, didn't exist on day one. You know, day one, it was adopt now and, you know, the, the errata process wasn't really that formed up, but we were getting errata points. So that, you know, one thing led to another. But it, the, the, the Salesforce automation allows a lot of that so that every time something goes to you know, info at openstacks.org, it feeds into Salesforce. Every time you get an errata suggestion, it feeds in and things like that. And, I, you know, I think automated systems, you know, Trello can probably do some of that and things like that if you have it hooked up to your email. But but um, you know that that's how it is. We don't have a dedicated person on the the point about the um, submissions. I'll say I, I, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. It's it's a double edged sword. I think. I mean, you want as many submissions and contributions as you as you can can get. Um, but on the same token, as as most you know, small organizations, nonprofits, we can't do everything. So you know, it's it's it, we can't always take a proposal to do something brand new and, you know, and, and things like that. On the other hand, we really want to encourage that. So, um, you know, we, like OpenStax, we've 
seen a hole in what we're communicating about that. And I mean, I just actually put out a blog post about our process and we'll do another one about the actual authoring process. But I think, I think, uh, you know, it's a very good point about having more about being, you know, opening contributors and, and how that's managed and, and what options that exist. It's, it's a, it's an important point to keep the momentum going and keep the, the ideas flowing. You know, I'm seeing lots of great commentary um, in the chat about uh, bookstores uh, and bookstores, whether or not faculty are being asked to report to the bookstore, even if they're not using something that the bookstore has purchased for them, whether that's some other book that they could purchase on Amazon or whether it's an OER. Um, does anyone have any experience sort of with that interaction with bookstores as they pertain to OER, like maybe the bookstore is even printing it for the students, course packs, that sort of a thing? Yeah, I can I can say something quickly. Um, I'm Christina Hendricks. I'm at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, uh, in Canada. Um, I'm not sure why, but the director of our bookstore is really, really supportive. Um, she's on our, we have an open group, you know, that meets every month to talk about open stuff at the university, and uh, she's on there. Um, I think the idea is that they just really are want to save students money. They're, they're not, a, I guess they're not a profit-making enterprise. I'm not sure why, but they do print things. Uh, they do print open textbooks. They, as I mentioned in the chat, they ask us to say if we're using an OER, and then they will actually ask us what OER it is, right? So they do get some information about um, uh, open textbooks from that, but, you know, reporting is very spotty, right? People will only go to the bookstore website if they are getting a book from the bookstore, right? If faculty members. So that's, it's not the best, but it's something um, and I, we're thinking of trying to have a way where faculty members and students can go to one place and in that one place you can just, if you're a faculty member, you can write down what text you want to use and some of them will go to the bookstore and some of them will, you know, be OER and some of them will be go to the library for reserves and, and then students can find all that in one place and then it'll be easy to report, <laughs> but that's like 20 years down the road, so. Anyway, that's just a quick thought. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to kind of jump in here too with that. <laughs> so we're, we're still kind of working with our bookstore and we do have some, they do have a, a, an open stacks book that's through the bookstore. But again, our bookstore only gets what faculty information faculty provide them. And so even though our deadlines for book submissions are fairly early, a lot of faculty don't make those deadlines. And so when students do click the links for their books, it, there's no, it's saying there's nothing there. Um, and then even in the case of um, with OER, it even just says like there's no required textbook, but I, I have found that that confuses students. So I love the idea of having kind of everything in one, in one place where it's like, oh, it's an OER or it's at the library. Um, we do have some um, textbooks on reserve in the library, but again, um, it's not in a place that I think is convenient for students or faculty to find. So that's definitely something that we can work on and build relationships with. So one of the things um, that's, oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I can, uh, I can wait until you're done. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, uh, well, um, I'm Jennifer Parsons. I have no camera on my computer, so I apologize. Um, I'm the digital resources librarian at Central Methodist University, and our experience has been quite similar to what Christina has um, described. We actually have a bookstore manager who's very supportive um, and who has tried to make clear, you know, she's not getting paid if you adopt a textbook versus an open educational resource. Um, it is a priority of hers to have a list of textbooks um, for each course, each semester. Uh, but, but this is also helpful for students because we can quickly look up a textbook that they need if they come by asking, do you have XYZ? Um, so the form that's used, when I showed her the OER, OE, OTN, I remember her looking at the, that would be easy. Just simply give me a, an ISBN, give me, an, give me a title that goes into the form quickly. We also have a course management system that allows uh, faculty to post links, and faculty have looked at that and have been really, oh, I can simply post a link to my textbook in my course. Um, there, there is no, like, where do I go to get it? No, no, it's right here in the course management system where you go to have discussions, where you go to turn in your homework. There, there's no excuse. You can easily find it.
So one of the things that I was going to mention is that in Oregon, uh, the legislature recently mandated that all Oregon universities put within their course bulletins if the course is a low cost or no cost. So it's a really great way for students to be able to look to see what courses are being offered and that have OERs. Um, and so that's been the place where we've gone to start to look to see, you know, what other uh, faculty members are using OERs, not just specifically ours, but, you know, ones for OpenStax or if they're using library resources. Um, and in regards to the bookstore, we, what I have heard from faculty that have created um, an open textbook through our program is that the, they've just told the bookstore to put a little card that says, you know, this book is free, you can, download it, you know, through this site. So the bookstore is happy to sort of make that note and, and not have to purchase, you know, they, they don't go and purchase any of um, any of the books for them. So it's it's been kind of difficult to sort of see, um, at least what from my perspective, with what the bookstore wants to do at Portland State. Um, but we've been trying to have conversations with them because we do see it as a really important partner. And then I also wanted to just quickly mention too, that there was a question about you know, how do you know how, how, what to do with the book? Um, so one of the things we require all of our textbook authors to do is to actually state what, what course the book was designed for, what level of students the book was designed for, um, and sort of a brief description of what is included in the book just to give faculty from other institutions an opportunity to sort of see and explore that and think about it if it's even going to be relevant to their class before they even get started because we have a lot of higher level courses so we've got a lot of third four like third year fourth year courses so we do want to make sure that we're really specific on what type of students are um, is this book actually created for Fantastic, thank you. Um, I actually have a follow-up question to you in chat from R. Sanders. Um, he asks how um, Oregon's mandate has been received by the professors who have the charge to choose the texts. Uh, that is a very good question. We're still trying to discover that. It just got mandated uh, this winter term. Um, so it's only been one term, so we're not even certain. And um, the, I'm not aware of every university in Oregon currently like uh, following the mandate. So we're trying to uh, make sure that everyone statewide is, is trying to follow. So there's a lot of questions still because it's very, very new. And Christina has noted that a number of institutions gather the data on OER adoptions and sometimes adaptations. She wonders if um, how many of those reports are shared back with the OT providers. So in your case, have you ever heard from another institution, hey, we are adopting these books from your catalog? Does that happen from time to time? Adopting sort of our textbooks that we've created or yes like do you get are there other institutions who will out of courtesy come to you and report that they are also adapting those oh um i've only heard from one <laughs> so far um so i just don't know if if that's just um people just don't yeah I, and i don't know how much sometimes the librarians may or may not know as well it really i think depends on the relationship that they have with the faculty and there are some really a lot of go-getter faculty that are just going to download and, and get started right away so if they don't know to contact us um, and they don't work with the librarian at their institution it, it, there there isn't that level of um, sort of information exchange um, robin ashford asks if that oregon mandate is for public higher ed institutions only yeah, it is. Sorry. It is the public higher ed educational institutions. I would just like to um, point out how many people have mentioned the bookstore has been a good partner in um, trying to gather this data. And that is actually something we hear more and more often in the OTN community. Um, we talked about it last summer at our um, gathering. We have someone on our steering committee who um, works in the bookstore. That's Bob Butterfield at University of Wisconsin. So sometimes they can be a really helpful partner to turn to and reach out to. Um, their, I think, main revenue source are mugs and sweatshirts, and so they're not too concerned about books any longer. Um, I also wanted to just share a, a link in the chat. You know, 
as I add things to the Open Textbook Library, I see a wide variety of author and publisher pages, which is where all of the book data comes from. And so I, as we were talking, I thought, you know, there are, there are a couple of good examples I could track down of um, authors and publishers who are trying to gather the same data directly. So it's not an institution. Um, it's the people making, in this case, the open uh, textbook. So from open logic, you can see what kind of information they wanted in their form, how they try and um, gather that information. It, it's a little bit buried. Um, I'm going to keep looking because I think there's another another one out there where they really have it front and center if you, you know, go to their landing page. And there you have it. The Clinique makeup counter and Wildcat gear is uh, what, what bookstores are, are really thinking about right now. <laughs> You know, I had one question, um, and I wondered if anyone had made specific outbound efforts, particularly probably OpenStax um, might speak to this, to actually reach faculty in a certain subject matter. Once you know you're doing a series of business books, for instance, as you mentioned, do you then approach a certain cadre of business faculty? And, and if so, how do you find those potential adopters if you do that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, for both the adoption aspect, marketing, quote unquote, but or also the reviewing and development portions um, to, to onboard reviewers and make sure representing a pretty diverse set, you know, from a number of different regions and uh, types of schools and, and things like that. Um, we do a lot of outbound. Um, the, the first thing we do is we have to get those those names, just like you're saying. We, um, we do that a few different ways. We um, do everything from sort of mining conference proceedings and programs to uh, doing, um, you know, there's, there's systems, actually one of them was just, just shut down, but there's a system called PubTrack that tracks uh, the usage of all textbooks at university bookstores that report to it at least, and about 60% of the bookstores reported to it. And while that's not 100%, it's still, you get a lot of names that way. So between those two things, um, that was a lot of the sourcing. And then we also, um, you know, just undertake it word of mouth, uh, networking organizations and so on. And then we do reach out to those folks first to take part in the book development, either answering surveys about the course or um, undertaking, uh, um, uh, you know, being a reviewer, being a contributor and so on. And then that all converts into these marketing efforts where we do outreach and then we try to follow up and, and you know, track the adoptions that way. So um, we do try, we do try to, we do try to really try to really at, at sometimes at the institutional level um, or the personal preference regarding what their, their contact preferences and data usage. We don't share any of the information um, about our adopters or anything like that with anybody else. Even our partners, we don't formally, just to make a note of that, because I mentioned partners, we don't share the individual adopters' names. We will say, hey, we, you know, we're in use at the school, but we don't ever share the name um, or, or something like that. That's, that's really interesting, um, I think. Uh, so there was one question from way back about the, self, the danger of self-reporting surveys. I'm wondering if any of our participants have thoughts about uh, whether or not those accurately represent the use of the book. For instance, if all you have is the self-reporting, I assume that does not represent quite a few people using the book. Does that, is that a danger? If, if, I think each of you probably have a perspective to bring to that. Or maybe not. <laughs> So um, I guess I can kind of at least to see if faculty have adopted. Um, I recently did a survey where <laughs> faculty and students were report or were supposed to self-report and um, there were not <laughs> very many um, that actually um, completed the survey. And so I think that the danger comes with its, I mean, obviously we want it to be voluntary. Um, and so but I think that it gives us, um, at least in my case, it definitely gave an, an inaccurate sample of, of what is actually happening on campus. Um, but I do think that it does provide some at least useful information. But um, I think I'm not sure that there is, an, at least for me at that point, there's just not another way to go other than to ask for people to complete these surveys and to answer my emails and let me know how many students and which course and 
things like that. So I would love if, if people have advice or tips and tricks to actually getting faculty to respond. <laughs> Academia despises mandates, um, but it seems very much if the institution is going to function, perhaps appealing to the institutions to do the tracking themselves, perhaps through a particular dean's office. So the deans are re become responsible for tracking the textbooks used within their own colleges. Um, that would be, you know, would, would certainly go down, to, you know, that would be handed off to chairs and if chairs tracked it or if the admins tracked it simply course by course, it'd be a fairly simple thing. Um, then nobody has to report to the tech, to the, uh, to the bookstore. You simply shift, shift the material over to uh, the bookstore at a, at a certain time. Uh, the problem with self-reporting is that it's, there's no motivation to it. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing to, to say as I teach, I don't know, I teach history. If I teach history that what does, what does filling in a blank tell me or do for me or my classes? So it seems to me that if, if reporting for textbooks is going to really happen, it probably will be as an administrative function and not as a library function. And in that case, let's go looking for administrators. And I can say that because I'm part of the evil empire. Um, Thank you. That's, that's a great point. Um, we have quite a lot of um, chatter in the chat um, still on bookstores. Robin Ashford says that OpenStax announced a new edition of a biology textbook, which she's forwarded to the biology department faculty, sort of with links to the new edition, making it easy for them to adopt, um, and potentially the motivation, of course, redesign stipend dollars uh, to help motivate them to adopt. I'm curious if others have those sorts of budgets to incentivize faculty um, as well. So this is Jody Bailey from the University of Texas at Arlington, and we do have a grant program. Um, in fact, our um, our next cohort just we just received proposals from the next cohort. Um, this was the second year we've done it, and um, our open education librarian Michelle Reed and I have worked on this program, but she's really the leader on that. She was unable to be here today, um, but the. Um, it, it does seem to be uh, helping to incentivize faculty to adapt, adopt, and, and even create. And this semester, we actually, or excuse me, this round of grants for this year, we actually divided the grant program up into different categories. And one was just a flat out um, adoption. The other was um, a scale grant and an innovation grant. So a scale grant was would be for um, a, um, multiple sections of a very large course offering like a uh, history 101 for example um, if every professor you know um, in that in that department agreed to use that that new uh, OER then they they could receive a scale grant and then the innovation grant was for OER creation so um, it is going well and that's and that's uh, a really great way to incentivize that the use of OER. Um, but I also wanted to comment, since I have the mic now, about the the, um, the the topic we were talking about earlier about the difficulty of finding out who's using what. And to me, um, I don't know, just sitting here listening to everybody having the same problem we're having, um, it almost makes me think that can we somehow leverage the, the thing that's already being used that we know every single faculty member uses to communicate to students what their course materials are, and that is the syllabus. Um, has anyone thought about that um, who's in chat or any of the presenters? Um, it just, I don't know, it just seems like, I know in Texas all of our uh, faculty are required by law to post their syllabus online, and we have a place where they all do that. Um, so I'm just wondering if it might be possible if anyone has tried mining that, mining those syllabi for information. 
and I'll mute myself. Jody, um, your question inspired me to put a link in the chat about the open syllabus project. Um, we've had a couple of conversations with them and haven't quite figured out um, any potential paths forward, but I think you're definitely on to something if there could be a way to um, read all of those syllabi that are out there and, and, and pull that data. Um, it would be nice to leverage an existing um, tool, <laughs> existing data, um, it seems really hard. This is a tough problem. <laughs> this is interesting. Robin says they use both the syllabus and the registration system to identify library ebooks and open textbooks being used in courses. Um, it's time consuming, but we have trained a couple of student workers and then librarians verify what is found. That seems like a really good idea to me too. I know when um, I adjunct from time to time and I have to put my my textbook, whatever it happens to be, in a space somewhere in the, the LMS and someone somewhere must have access to all that data. Um, so that's a pretty interesting, she says it's tough but would love a simpler solution. Um, interesting. I'm trying to scan through here to see if we had any other questions. Liz, as you scan, I think um, many people who are here already know, but um, we do incentivize faculty even just to explore the open textbook library um, when institutions join as members. It's how we acknowledge their time in introducing them to these resources and it is found to be um, effective. Dave did many iterations and I think that uh, getting Getting some incentive is always helpful when possible, although it's not um, it's not a necessity. Some some institutions don't have that, and we can um, work together to find other ways. But it it can certainly grease the wheels. Liz, how does the chat look? Do we? Oh, go ahead, Rosie. Uh, I was just going to say that we also um, at SUU we also have um, we call them the curriculum innovation grants to incentivize faculty and. For the last um, for the last year, we've had um, either an OER track or this tra this year it's an open pedagogies track. So you're using an OER and develop or developing one um, or doing something like that, as well as other tracks too. And so we've had uh, we found that those have been very successful in incentivizing faculty. Fantastic. I'm not seeing new questions, but I did want to call attention to Cheryl, um, Cheryl's comment. Her challenge is getting the correct enrollment numbers uh, for the classes that she can see where an open textbook has been adopted. Sometimes it's pre-drop ads, so the, the numbers may not be accurate. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, Cheryl also asked, Robin, can you ask your campus store for a list of all the required textbooks? And I suppose that gets back to the bookstore edition and the answer would be if faculty are reporting accurately to the bookstores it seems. So we're coming up upon uh, 1 p.m. so I'm going to take one last call. If anyone has any questions feel free to break in or put them in the chat. And I'm not seeing any, Karen. I'm not either. So um, Tim, Karen, Anthony, and Rosie, thank you very much for sharing your experience and your stories. And everyone who joined us, thank you for sharing your questions and your own experience and stories um, in our conversation and in the chat. It's always nice to see everyone and think together on these questions that can feel um, overwhelming at times and perhaps insurmountable, but little by little we're making progress. Um, and the progress couldn't happen if it wasn't collaborative. So um, I will bid adieu and thank Liz and the Rebus community for um, co-hosting office hours with us. We look forward to seeing you next month uh, for an exciting reveal. <laughs>